America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. I call to order the 87th day of the 108th legislature, first session. Senators, please record your presence. Roll call.
Mr. Clerk, please record. Mr. Corn President, Mr. President. Thank you, Mr. Clerk. Are there any corrections for the journal? I have no corrections this morning. Thank you. Are there any messages, reports, or announcements? Just one notice, Mr. President. The Health and Human Services Committee will hold an executive session under the South Balcony at 1030 today. Health and Human Services ex Exec Session under the South Balcony at 1030. That's all I have this time. Thank you, Mr. Clerk. Senator Clemens would like to welcome a guest under the South Balcony. It's Dan McMahon, Associate Pastor, Faith Lutheran Church in Lincoln, Nebraska. Please rise and be welcomed. Senator Boston would like to recognize our, our doctor, our family physician of the day, Dr. George Voigtlander of Lincoln, Nebraska. Thank you very much. While the legislature is in session and capable of transacting business, I propose to sign and do hereby sign LRs 249, 253, 254, 255, 256, 257, 258, 259, 260, 261, 262, 263, 264, 265, 266, 267, 268, 269, 270, 271, 272, and 273. We will now proceed to the first item on the agenda, Mr. Clerk. As a reminder, we are on final reading. We ask senators if you would please find your seats. Mr. Clerk. Mr. President, final reading, Legislative Bill 138E. Colleagues, the first vote is to dispense with the at-large reading. All those in favor, vote aye. All those opposed, vote nay. Mr. Clerk. 36 days, three days dispensed with the at-large reading. The at-large reading is dispensed with. Mr. Clerk, please read the title. 
Green girl slash should be 130 inch by boss 25 guys 25 grade 20 grade for your certificate 40 buff and the chip should message 30 30 30 30 30 30 30 30 30 30 30 30 30 30 30 30 30 30 30 30 30 30 30 30 30 30 30 30 30 30 30 30 30 30 30 30 30 30 30 30 30 30 30 30 30 30 30 30 30 30 30 30 30 30 30 30 30 30 30 30 30 30 30 30 30 30 30 30 30 30 30 30 30 30 30 30 30 30 30 30 30 30 30 30 30 30 30 30 30 30 30 30 30 30 30 30 30 30 for the spread these highway cash flow through schedules for the aeronautic domain transfer to the central curb should be due to the threshold moment of construction of a federal law. So, if it's a motor vehicle, I sign to the short track of the adventure selection of five tree, change for the certain penalty change for the Thomas Price Trap, Harmonized Ridge Pride Operative Base Group to reveal the original section and to declare an emergency. All provisions of law. Relative to procedure have been complied with. The question is, shall be 138 pass with the emergency clause attached? All those in favor vote aye. All those opposed vote nay. LB 138 passes with the emergency clause attached. Record, Mr. Clerk. Voting ayes, Senators Aguilar, Albright, Arch, Armanderas, Ballard, Bostar, Bossman, Brand, Breezy, John Cavanaugh, Clements, Conrad, DeBoard, K, Dorn, Dover, Dungan, Urban, Fredrickson, Holler, and Hanson, Hart, and Holcroft, Hughes, Ibot, Jacobson, Cout, Linehan, Lippicott, Lowe, McDonald, McKinney, Mosher, Berman, Reapy, Sanders, Vargas, Von Gillen, Walls, Wayne, Wishard. Voting no, none, not voting. Senators Bossman, Michaela Cavanaugh, Blood, Brewer, Day, Hunt, Ray, Bolton, Slam, and the voters. 41 A's, no nays, two present, not voting, six excused, not voting, Mr. President. LB 138 passes with the emergency clause attached. Next item, Mr. Clerk. Mr. President, Girls Legislative Bill 138A, and Chief by Boss 25 Bill Connect, really appropriate, appropriate funds, and the care of the legislature, for 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 the Mr. Clerk, please record. Voting ayes, Sims Aguilar, Albright, Arch, Armanders, Ballard, Boston, Bostar, Boston, Brandt, Breezy, John Kavanaugh, Clements, Conrad, DeBoer, Decay, Dorn, Dover, Dungan, Urban, Fredrickson, Holler, Hanson, Harden, Holcroft, Hughes, Ibot, Jacobson, Cal, Linehan, Lipcott, Lowe, McDonald, McKinney, Mosher, Merman, Reapy, Sanders, Vargas, Von Gillen, Walls, Wayne, Wishart. Voting no, none, not voting. Senators Michaela Kavanaugh, Blood, Brewer, Day, Hunt, Rabel, and Slama. The vote is 42 A's, no nays, one present, not voting, six excused, not voting, Mr. President. LB 138 passes with the emergency clause attached. Mr. Clerk, next item. Mr. President, final reading, Legislative Bill 298. The first vote is to dispense with the at-large reading. All those in favor, vote aye. All those opposed, vote nay. Please record, Mr. Clerk. 
37 A's, 3 A's dispensed with the at large reading. The at large reading is dispensed with. Mr. Clerk, please read the title. Green Gross Legislative Bill 298, issued by Linehan 39, DeBoer 10, Conrad 46, Bill for Necrolating an Education Amendment Section 79 101, revised statute of supplement 2022, to require each school district to collect and provide information regarding learning disabilities and school board of each school district to adopt a written dress code. Grooming policy as prescribed to require the State Department of Education to provide a report and to, to develop model. Model dress code and grooming policy for schools described to adopt the Interstate Teacher Mobility Compact, to provide a duty for the State Board of Education to define and redefine terms, to harmonize provisions, and to repeal the original section. All provisions of law relative to procedure having been complied with, the question is, shall LB 298 pass? All those in favor vote aye. All those opposed vote nay. Mr. Clerk, please record. Voting aye, Senators Aguilar, Albright, Arch, Armanderas, Ballard, Boston, Bostar, Boston, and Brandt, Breezy, Kavanaugh, Kavanaugh, Clemens, Conrad, DeBoer, Decay, Dorn, Dover, Dungan, Urban, Fredrickson, Holler, and Hanson, Harden, Holcroft, Hughes, Iba, Jacobson, Cal, Flanahan, Lippicott, Lowe, McDonald, McKinney, Mosier, Merman, Raybould, Reapy, Sanders, Vargas, Von Gillen, Walls, Wayne, Wisher. Voting no, none, not voting, Senators Blood, Brewer, Day, Hunt, and Slama. But it's 44 A's, no nays, five excused, not voting, Mr. President. LB 298 passes. Mr. Clerk, next item. Mr. President, Gross Legislative Bill 298A, inch by Lynn Hanthorne, I vote for an appropriate appropriation for something that the provisional of 298 and 100 will be an appropriate section one, this program will amend switch from the general fund to the use 24 to 1 million, 120 general fund to be used 24 state department to get 25 year provisional legislative bill on 10 years, 100 less than 23. So she's been determined to temper and put in allocated in that section. I'll exceed 7,310 for the fiscal year 23 to 4, or 69,676 for fiscal year 24 25. All provisions of law relative to procedure having been complied with. The question is, shall LB 298A pass? All those in favor, vote aye. All those opposed, vote nay. Mr. Clerk, please record. Voting aye, Senator Zagular, Albright, Arch, Armandares, Ballard, Boston, Bostar, Boston, Brandt, Breezy, Kavanaugh, Kavanaugh, Clemens, Conrad, DeBoer, Decay, Dorn, Dover, Dungan, Urban, Fredrickson, Holler, and Hanson, Harden, Holcroft, Hughes, Ibaugh, Jacobson, Calf, Linehan, Lipicott, Lowe, McDonald, McKinney, Mosher, Merman, Raybould, Reapy, Sanders, Vargas, Von Gillen, Walls, Wayne, Wishard. Voting no, none, not voting. Senators Blood, Brewer, Day, Hunt, and Slotman. The vote is 44 A's, no nays, no president, not voting. Five excuse, not voting, Mr. President. LB 298A passes. Mr. Clerk, next item. Mr. President, single item, a reference report from the referencing committee concerning LR 274. Concerning the agenda, Mr. President, next bill, motions to override legislative bill 814. First of all, the appropriations committee would offer MO 1149 to override the governor's light item veto in LB 814 in section 35, auditor public accounts program 506, state agency and county post audits, section 36, auditor public accounts program 525, cooperative audits. Senator Clements, you're welcome to open on the motion. Thank you, Mr. President and colleagues. When the governor vetoes items in the budget, by Rule 6, Section 14, the Appropriations Committee shall meet to review the vetoes for possible overrides. 
The Appropriations Committee met on Thursday, May 25th to discuss any potential override recommendation of the governor's line item vetoes in the mainline budget, LB 814. The committee discussed many of the vetoes and reached a majority for three recommendations for the body to consider. The committee report handout that I just uh, had sent out says Appropriations Committee Report shows those items and the sections of the bill uh, affected and shows the roll call vote uh, of each one of those. And um, the first item that we're going to take up is regarding Medicaid provider rates. Uh, that's in motion, uh, I'm assuming it's 1149, okay. My notes say 1150. Just, Making sure provider rates are motion 1149. Is that correct, Mr. Speaker? Mr. Clerk? No, Senator, this would be the Auditor of Public Accounts, MO 1149. I had requested the provider rates to be first. In that case, Mr. President, MO 1150. In that case, Mr. President, MO 1150 from the Appropriations Committee override the governor's line item veto in LB 814 in section 96, Agency 25, Department of Health and Human Services, Program 344, Children's Health Insurance, and section 98, Agency 25, Department of Health and Human Services, Program 348, Medical Assistance. Senator Clement, you may continue. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, apologize for the confusion uh, to the body. And on the committee report, you'll see that showing as item number one. You can see the sections and the the votes in the committee. The uh, it's there are two parts. Children's health insurance called CHIPS is one of the items. Uh, the general fund. Uh, the first year of 3% increase is retained by the governor, but the second year 2% increase was vetoed. The um, amount of that would be 465,355 of general funds. And the second part of it is other medical assistance, Medicaid items. The general fund, again, 3% was retained by the governor. 2% was vetoed, um, and that's 14,797,042 was a decrease in the second year only. The vote for the, in the committee recommendation was five to four on each of those items. And I, uh, now that's my close, I'll be discussing more and if people have questions, I'm willing to answer them. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Wisher, you are recognized to speak. Thank you, Mr. President. I rise in support of the motion to override the veto on provider rate increases. And before I go into more detail as to why I voted as a member of the Appropriations Committee to uh, advance this to the full body for discussion and, and hopefully for your support. I, I just wanted to point out, especially to the, to the new members, that this is not the first time many of us in this body have been in this instance in which there is a negotiation and debate about uh, funding in our budget. And I think it's important to note that, and it's important for me to note that, that just because I, in this instance, disagree 
with the governor's decision and the chair of appropriations decision, um, that's not a bad thing. That's the way that legislation is created. Uh, it's good for us to, to challenge each other on, on different issues. And so in this instance, I would challenge this body to recognize that what we're talking about today are basically three constituencies. We're talking about seniors, care for seniors. We're talking about hospital care for those who are in crisis situations. And we're talking about children, colleagues. Those are the three constituencies that are impacted by these provider rate cuts. And the reason why I call them a cut is that a 3% increase and a 0% increase or even a 2% increase as we originally proposed in an inflationary period of 6 or 7% is absolutely a cut, colleagues. We are asking providers to tighten their belt. And while this is going to impact my constituency in Lincoln, the communities that are going to be impacted the most are rural communities, by far. And I'm sure you've heard from your constituents over the weekend about the importance of funding, the, the, the absolute importance for funding for rural hospitals and the, the necessity of us to continue to support our, our hospitals, especially in rural communities, because if we don't, colleagues, then people in your districts will not be able to get the services that are life-saving. And we're also talking about children's health care. We have made a lot of decisions this year in this legislative body regarding the impact to children. And for us in these last days to be voting not to continue to fund and increase funding for children's health care, I think is very concerning to me. As a member of the Appropriations Committee, I have watched for over seven years as providers come in year after year talking to us about the fact that they cannot provide the services and cover the cost of those services with the rates that we are giving them. They literally are not, it's not like they're breaking even, they are in the red. And what is concerning to me is that this is the same year in which we as a state have chosen to increase state employees' salaries for the Department of Health and Human Services by a 5% and in 7%. But now we're choosing for those who provide similar services in our communities, our businesses who provide care for seniors, our hospitals, we are choosing to give them a 3% and a 0%. Colleagues, that does not make sense. And what we're going to end up with, if we continue to not fund the obligations of the state in terms of absolute priority services, emergency room services, is we're going to end up with more and more of these services shutting down. And we're already seeing it. Time, Senator. While the legislature is in session and capable of transacting business, I propose to sign and do hereby sign LB 138E, LB 138AE, LB 298, and LB 298A. Senator Vargas, you are recognized to speak. Thank you very much. You know, it's funny, I was thinking about sort of the missing voice of Senator Stinner specifically his sort of quarterback father voice uh, and just missing it in these times where, you know, we don't always agree on every single issue, especially even within the appropriations committee. We just don't. I mean, that, that's just the truth. Um, but there is a, 
I think there's a special place when there is not necessarily consensus, but there's a group of individuals that say, I think we can and should do better. And so this is kind of picking off of picking up off of where Senator Wishart was. I support the override, and my reasons are fairly simple. Uh, I think we supported many of the initiatives that the governor brought forward. I think we were a very fair appropriations committee. We supported the Education Future Fund. We supported the funding for the canal. We were doing many of these big historic investments because they were really important things to do when we have higher revenue coming into our state. But simultaneously, when we have good revenue years, the two things we prioritize this year, one of which is giving money back to taxpayers in the form of tax cuts, which I support. But the second thing that I've said, both on and off the mic, is that we should be investing in the basic programs that are helping children, families, and seniors. We're not talking about a new program. We're not talking about expanding eligibility. We're talking about whether or not the lowest income individuals children and families and seniors are we're going to continue to get the care that they need and the workforce is there to make sure that they are supported that's what this is about i know some people look at this as well we got some in the first year but what i look at is we are losing out on millions of dollars in state general funds. And from those millions of dollars state general funds, we will be losing out over the next four years of nearly $90 million in federal funds. $90 million in federal funds for two programs that quite honestly are the ones that have been driving poverty lower and have been covering more uninsured individuals in the state. To Senator Wishart's point, this is not about whether or not we agree or disagree, or sorry, whether or not this is a fight with the governor or the executive branch. This is whether or not we have a policy or an investment disagreement in the nature of our budget. I wanna support things that are working. And as we have seen, the Medicaid and CHIP have significantly expanded healthcare coverage for uninsured. In its early years, 1997 to 2012, millions of uninsured children gained coverage. And the uninsured rate for children fell by half from 14% to a historic low of 7%. We are talking about whether or not we have the workforce that is needed to make sure that children, families, and seniors have the coverage that is needed. And the question is, what happens if we don't do this? I know there's some talk that we can come back we can fund it better, or maybe we don't fund it at all. But the message that we are sending to hospitals, Medicaid providers, assisted living, long-term care facilities, and children across the state right now is wait and see. The majority of people on this floor voted for the budget One knowing minute. that this was part of it, and it was a really important thing that we put into the budget. Even though it wasn't full agreement within the Appropriations Committee, I find that it is really telling when we hear from constituents outside of this floor that this is an important enough thing to protect. And that it also is our independence as an Appropriations Committee and as a legislature saying that we are making historic investments in all these other governor initiatives and also in tax cuts and tax relief but also making the investments that are necessary to make sure that seniors, children, and families are protected. That's the reason why I voted for it in committee. It's the reason why I voted for it when it was actually in the budget to begin with. And for many of you that voted for the budget, that's the reason why I think we need to protect it. We said no to about 20 other items or 19 other items and we did not override. This is a critical one that tells Nebraska, that we care. Time, Senator. Thank you. Senator Jacobson, you are recognized. Thank you, Mr. President. Well, I rise uh, in opposition uh, to the motion to override the veto of the governor, and I want to uh, make it clear as to why I've decided to take that approach. 
Uh, I will be opposing all of the veto override attempts, uh, and I'm doing it for this reason. Uh, we've had an amazing session, have accomplished a lot. We have a new governor who had a very ambitious vision of where he wants to take this state, and we've accomplished many of those goals. So as I've looked at the veto overrides, and I will tell you specifically as it relates <clears throat> to this particular issue, uh, I want to explain the specific points as to why I can support sustaining the governor's veto. The governor originally had proposed a zero, zero increase. And I was able to work with the governor and he was very open with me. There were several issues along the way that I've raised and the governor ultimately agreed as with the appropriations recommendations uh, to go to a 3% provider rate increase in year one, uh, but has decided to not approve the 2% on the second year. I've introduced an interim uh, uh, legislative resolution 171, which is an interim study uh, as it relates to behavioral health, uh, psychiatric facilities, hospital-based psychiatric uh, units, uh, to look at rebasing. We haven't had rebasing of Medicaid rates for many, many years. And I think that's critically important and that will provide the groundwork for why in year two, we will see increases, what I would hope to be much greater than the 2% that was, that was recommended by the Appropriations Committee. So the fact is we have a 3% that's staying in place year one. There's no emergency to do anything now. The legislature can come back next session and either go to 2% or greater next year. So there's no reason to have to do the veto override on this particular issue for that reason. Let me just tell you a little bit about provider rates. Uh, I can tell you this is critically important. Everything Senator Wishart said is exactly true. We're gonna lose our rural health care providers if we cannot properly fund them. And I don't believe 3% is enough. I think the committee needed to be more ambitious than they were at three and two. But I can tell you that once we do the study on interim study, I think we're gonna have all the pieces we need to move that forward. Let's be clear that when you look at most rural hospitals uh, and, and really any of the hospitals, and in North Platte, we have a hospital that we receive about 75% of our costs from Medicare and Medicaid. They represent about 60% to 70% of the total payers. Guess where the rest of that gets made up? Blue Cross and Blue Shield and Medica, the two health insurance, primary health insurance providers in the state. So at the end of the day, if we don't adequately provide for Medicaid, which is state funded, we're gonna put a bigger burden on our insurance companies, uh, the, the health insurance companies, who are gonna have to raise premiums to, cause, uh, to offset those additional costs that they're gonna be faced with for their insured uh, customers that are getting care in these hospitals. I don't think that's the right place for that burden. I think it needs to be placed more uh, with the state as a whole. We need to understand that hospitals are required to treat everyone who comes, thank you Mr. President, has, is required to treat every patient that presents themselves. Believe it or not, hospitals are faced with a situation today where you cannot release a patient unless they have a safe place to be released to. And guess who pays for that once they no longer need hospital care but are still housed there? It's the hospital. That's an unsustainable business model. So ultimately these rates need to go up, but I don't believe it's an emergency this year. I don't think it's worthy of a veto override. Let's take the bigger view, come back next year, decide what we need to do next year, stick with the 3% this year. So I'm gonna vote to uh, sustain the veto, or to sustain the veto and really work to next year, would encourage my colleagues to do the same. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Conrad, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. President. Good morning, colleagues. I rise in support of the motion to override the veto and want to provide um, just some foundational comments in regards to this specific item and then the other motions that the body will have before it in regards to our budgetary process uh, later today. So 
as a former eight-year member of the Appropriations Committee, as a senior member of this body, I thought it would be helpful to bring perhaps some context and a lens that I have utilized when making these challenging and important decisions, um, particularly as we have so many new members before us. And it may be instructive to helping to guide our head and our hearts when we take up these important matters together this morning. When I look at a veto override, particularly in relation to a budgetary matter, I see it not of a as a denial of friendship with our governor, but as an embrace of our constitutional duty, authority, and obligation, as an embrace of each other in terms of honoring the collective commitment we made to each other through the committee process, through three rounds of arduous debate, and in putting forward a thoughtful proposal to send to the governor for consideration when he has reservations, when he has concerns for policy, political, or legal reasons, our process allows him, under a strong separation of powers, to send it back to us for the final word as the people's representative in the people's house. I ask you today to look at the measured approach that the Appropriations Committee and the individual members are bringing forward. It is not a wholesale rejection in terms of what the governor vetoed, but it is thoughtful and it is measured to honor our constitutional commitment, our collective commitment to each other, and our commitment to our constituents. When you look at the substantive nature of these measures, particularly this first one, and I'm glad we're starting with healthcare. We know that this issue touches providers in every single one of our districts. This is not an urban rural split. This is not a blue or red issue. This is an issue that touches all Nebraskans and gives us more opportunity to strengthen our collective commitment to each other and our constituents. We know inflation has challenged our communities, our families, our states, and our businesses. It has also challenged our healthcare professionals. We know in the wake of COVID, there is a great deal of disruption and many, many challenges that our healthcare providers on the front lines are still unwinding from. We know today that about 71% of counties in Nebraska are already maternal health deserts. And if we remove adequate funding, modest increases in funding to combat an already overburdened and incredibly stressed healthcare system, that hurts our ability to support our communities. That hurts our ability to ensure we have healthy families. That hurts our shared commitment to growing our state and our economy, economy in every corner of Nebraska. When it comes to sustainability, you have made a clear One statement minute. in regards to the strength of our economy, and that is something we should be proud of. When it comes to equity, we cannot and should not celebrate the most significant tax relief for the wealthiest in our state while skimping corners for some of the poorest children in our state. From a sustainability perspective, we can afford it. From an equity perspective, we must override the veto, bring a lens of commitment for our our institution, each other, and our constituents, and maintain the bonds of friendship with our governor while we embark on this important duty and journey together this morning. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Dorn, you are recognized. Thank you, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, thank you for the discussion so far. Um, this is my fifth year up here, and part of throughout all that time, there's been a lot of discussion. I call it on provider rates or those types of issues that we have brought forward. There's also some other comments or things that have stuck with me through those years up here, and one of them I remember uh, when Senator Groney was here, we were going through redistricting and that type of stuff, uh, and he made a comment of, 
the discussion was why are uh, some of the districts like Senator Linehan growing so fast in some of our rural districts where we're losing population, we're losing uh, seats out there and they're moving east. And he made the comment that this body maybe isn't putting enough resources to those areas. And I followed up later that day with a comment that, you know, maybe Senator Groney's right. Part of what these provider rates are doing and part of what we heard in appropriations that was clear, very clear, is in our rural areas, the hospitals, the nursing homes are facing tremendous challenges. They haven't been able to keep up with inflation. They haven't been able to keep up with all the costs that are going on with all this. We've had nursing homes closed. We will be having more nursing homes closed. We will be having more hospitals, especially in the rural areas, facing challenges of closing or not, or how will they stay afloat? This proposal that the Appropriations Committee brought forward, uh, I think Senator Vargas commented on it, was a piece that needs to help rural areas, but also providers in urban areas in a longer term approach. We've done so many things this year as a body. The tax breaks, the income tax cuts, the, the property taxes to support so many areas in this state, some monumental things that haven't been done before. And yet we have a segment of our population, a segment of our what the state is responsible for the funding part of it that we are, I think, in my mind, shorting. Senator Vargas mentioned, yes, this is a uh, state funding, 14, 18 million dollars each of the next three years, but with that goes at least a one-to-one -one match of federal funds, sometimes a two-to-one -one match. We are not going to have 30 million out there each of the next three years in federal funds to help support those entities that are struggling. I do appreciate very much Senator Jacobs' comment, Senator Jacobson's comments about the interim study and those things and we need to do with the base rate. But what I will really do will challenge all of us to work with the governor and the governor's office to how we can correct this problem going forward because we have issues out there that unless we properly support them, properly fund them, properly have the right base and other things in place, as we go forward in the years ahead, we will face more challenges and more closings, and that population as it shifts east will continue, and we as a body are doing nothing but helping that population shift. Thank you very much. Senator Linehan, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. President, and good morning, colleagues. I am going to support the governor and I'm not gonna vote for any of the overrides. First, I want to compliment Chairman Clemens. I think he's done an excellent job as Chairman of Appropriations Committee. I also wanna comp compliment the whole committee. They do, it's a hard job, I understand it. They go through the budgets. I'm lucky if I read the whole budget, let alone put it all together. So it's not that I don't appreciate their hard work. I do. And I, I do echo that we have done huge things this year for Nebraska, and the tax cuts is part of that, but nobody's mentioned that we've already, we also put a billion dollars in the Education Future Fund, a billion dollars, committed 250 million each year going forward, and out of the billion, there'll be 300 million in new funding for public education in Nebraska, 300 million. We're going to cover 80% of all kids with special ed needs, not just in equalized schools. We're gonna make sure every child in, one of, in a public school in Nebraska gets some funding from the state. So if we're gonna talk about what we've all done, we have to talk about all of it. Governor Pillen proposed on provider rates, 0% and 0%. That's what he proposed. He worked with the committee and he has got a picture, he look, they look out six years, not just like four years like we do. And he is saying we get 3% this year on provider rates, which is what the committee proposed. 
We will come back next year, and if there's funding, the committee can make adjustments, and we won't be losing any federal money if we increase them next year. So an idea of the dollars we're talking about here, again, the governor proposed zero, the committee proposed 3%, that's $44 million. $44 million this year, $44 million next year. Now I'm not on appropriation, so if I'm making a mistake, I welcome anybody to correct me. But that's what I understand. What we're reducing is $15 million in the out year, which again, we can adjust when we come back next year. I think Governor Pill and his team have been accessible, willing to listen, easy to work with, and I don't want to end the year, a very successful year for many of us, in a bad note that over basically of the billions and billions of things we've done this year, we would have a fight over 15 million. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Ibaugh, you're recognized. Thank you very much, Mr. President. I rise to speak just to a few reminders of what our hospitals are currently facing. And I do appreciate Senator Dorn's um, and echo many of his comments as well as Senator Linehan's. I do think the governor has been very accessible and very uh, helpful. His office has been very helpful in processing um, where we're at and what resources we actually have. But we also have to remember that Nebraska hospitals continue to face some of the strongest financial um, headwinds in decades. And I know that specifically as I speak to my uh, critical access hospitals in rural Nebraska. Workforce costs have risen 26.8% since 2020. Medical supply costs are up 25.4%. And drug costs have risen 42.5%. Unbelievable. 60 to 80% 60 to 80 of hospitals revenue is uh, from government payers like Medicaid and Medicare, which we're discussing right now. And the average costs uh, the average loss for treating a Medicaid patient is 60%. So relative to that, we I think we all understand the importance of um, those rates and those rebasing and those um, costs that our hospitals receive. Nebraska hospitals care for Nebraskans 24-7. And um, as I speak specifically to my rural critical access hospitals and those elderly care providers that are in rural Nebraska, um, they're a lifeline for our rural citizens. And for those reasons, I continue, I urge continued support of their efforts. And um, thank you very much, Mr. President. Senator Clements, you are recognized to speak. Thank you, Mr. President. Somebody must have dropped out. I didn't know it was going to be this quick. All right, I was a no vote on this override, and um, I wanted to explain why on the uh, children's health insurance, the CHIPS program. Currently, in our budget, we have $22,590,000 for uh, children's health insurance benefits. The 3% in the first year that's being retained adds $677,000 in the first year and the $677,000 in the second year, which means in the second year, um, no, excuse me, in the first year, it'll increase to $23,267,000 in the second year, again, $23,267,000. Um, that's combined federal and, and state funds, I do believe, excuse me. Um, excuse, then the larger item, the medical, Medicaid, and the uh, current Medicaid 
general fund budget has $718,303,000 in fiscal year 2023. The 3% increase will add $21.5 million in the first year and that $21.5 million in the second year will carry forward. That makes the first, uh, the 3% will increase the first fiscal year to $739,852,000 of, that's the general funds. Federal funds, $1,439,000,000. So um, it'll be $2,179,000,000, but the, the state general funds of $739 million um, is, is opposed to a, the veto decreases the, the uh, amount by 14.7 million, but the increases of the 3% are 21.5 million in two, for two years. So that's 44 million that is being increased and 14.8 million not increased, but the uh, amount of increase is substantial. Uh, I do believe that we provide for people on Medicaid. My understanding is we have about 300,000 people receiving Medicaid benefits. If you divide the $2.1 billion of, of total funding by 300,000, you get $7,200 per person per year that uh, is being provided to Medicaid providers. And I uh, believe that the governor is being reasonable by offering uh, no decrease in the first year. In the second year, uh, we always do revisit the budget and there are opportunities for uh, providers to request an increase and let us One know um, if that's needed. And if there are um, requests, we will review those and prioritize those with next year's budget adjustment. And so I ask for your red vote on motion 1150. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Raybould, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. President. Good morning, colleagues. Good morning, fellow Nebraskans watching us on TV. I stand in support of the veto ride. It is so essential that we increase the provider rates right, like we have done, but make sure that they know that they will be getting another increase. I can tell you that I have been traveling around our state for at least nine if not 10 years campaigning in one form or another, having, having listening sessions primarily in our rural communities and paying an adequate provider rate is essential. It is essential to our rural communities. For the last nine years, our, our great service providers have been hanging on by a thread, trying to find ways to make their operations work, trying to find ways to pay the going rate so that they can retain their outstanding, wonderful workforce that is committed to caring for our seniors, that is committed to caring for children, that is committed to caring for the most vulnerable in our community. And Senator Dorn said it so clearly, we are seeing our nursing homes in our rural communities close at an alarming rate. And Senator Jacobson spoke so eloquently that what happens to those individuals that are hospitalized, they don't have that conduit to go into that nursing home to get a little bit of additional care. They don't need the hospital care because they're still healing, but they do need a little bit more time in rehabilitative care or assisted care, there's no place for them to go. And guess what? They stay in our hospitals. Senator Jacobson said that that cost is borne by the hospital. Yes, that is true. But guess what? That cost that the hospital incurs instead of being able to transfer that individual to a less costly form of care, 
That cost is borne by our taxpayers on Medicaid because that individual is staying at the hospital at a higher rate. It is borne by us, people who pay insurance. A hospital cannot sustain that cost of care for very long. Trust me, we have a number of hospital administrators and they know that for a fact. It gets passed on into increased rates for all the rest of us. I have always looked on making sure that we provide an operational rate to our wonderful service providers. I consider it a form of rural economic reinvestment. Or guess what? They're all gonna be moving east. And guess what? They are all moving east. So that leaves an aging population in our rural communities who need access to healthcare, who need access to nursing homes, I know firsthand, my uncles had such wonderful care at a nursing home in Madison. That closed. And it's unconscionable. It is unconscionable as people who profess to be of faith to give that extraordinary tax cut to the wealthiest individuals in our state of Nebraska and not take care of the most vulnerable population, our seniors. That's unacceptable. That is unacceptable. I don't know how we can truly profess to be a pro-life state when we do not take care of the most vulnerable in our community. And the truth is, in all, thank you. The truth is, in all my encounters over the last nine, 10 years of talking and listening sessions, we have been underfunding our providers for almost a decade. And you expect anyone to get caught up of attracting and retaining their workforce with a 2% increase or even a 3% increase when they're operating at a deficit right now. Colleagues, I urge you to vote yes in support of this override and ask you to do it, to think of how much money would some of those ranchers or farmers in the central part of our state be willing to forego to make sure that they have closer access to their loved ones so that we can, can keep our community hospitals viable, we can keep our nursing homes viable, and we can take care of the children in our state of Nebraska. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Reapy, you are recognized to speak. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, I apologize for being here tardy. Uh, we need to address uh, provider rates. Uh, one's health is critical to every other aspect of the good life. Our hospitals, both rural and urban, have been and continue to be challenged with major cost increases which have been cited and with greater federal, that being Medicare and, and state Medicaid patients, a blow margin payer mix. It's the payer mix that's, that's the challenge both of which pay less than the cost uh, save rural critical access hospitals, which gets cost plus, but that's only on their Medicaid patients, or Medicare patients, I'm sorry. All of healthcare is challenged with the need for staffing. We've talked about that this session. Uh, we've talked about it a lot, but we haven't done a lot of action. We did have one bill that is going to try to develop that, but that's going to take some time. The healthcare business is a labor-intensive business. In the interim, the Business and Labor Committee will study a workforce challenges in the healthcare to clarify uh, many challenges in a search of solutions. One variable, in any solution is competitive provider fees for the services as the state requires. We have managed to expand Medicaid into a variety of other services, and yet, in my opinion, have failed to provide the fees necessary for the basic services, which are essential to support the legislature's decision and the petition, if you will, to expand Medicaid. So we, we took a voter's referendum, to expand Medicaid, and now we have to step up and be accountable and to be, be able to pay for that, which takes staff. And as you all know, we are seriously short of medical um, health care nurses across the state. Uh, how much time do I have, Mr. President? 
How, do I have, how much time do I have? Two minutes thirty. I would, uh, I would, I would yield my last two minutes to Senator Wishart if she would like to have those. Senator Wishart, two minutes twenty seconds. Thank you, Mr. President. Colleagues, again, um, I think this has been a, a really good discussion, and the main points that that I'm hearing is that there is a need for us to continue to increase funding for those that care for seniors, our hospital systems, and children. I recognize that we're doing a 3% this year and a 0% next year, but colleagues, this is our biennial budget. What we should be budgeting, just like any person would do with their own smart budgeting techniques at home, is that if there is a need, an absolute priority that we must fund, then we should be funding that this year for the long run. We, yes, we can come back next year, but I'll be the first to say, I find it challenging to understand how next year we will have the dollars to do this when this is the year when we've had historic amounts of revenue. This should be the year with the historic amounts of revenue that we are funding our long-term obligations and absolutely children's health care, our hospital system, and supporters, is supporting seniors being a, able to age gracefully are priorities that we should have in our budget this year and we should be funding for the long term. And they should take priority of, over other funding obligations. And that's why I think it's essential that we craft a budget this year that prioritizes those key constituencies. The next time I get on the mic, I want to talk anecdotally about the experiences I hear from doctors, especially those who provide services in hospitals in rural communities and the challenges they experience. And the decision that we're making today is going to only aggravate those challenges into the future. Thank you. Senator Decay, you are recognized. Thank you, Mr. President. I agree with Senator Jacobson that our rural health care, including in my district, is at a crossroads. Going into the future, we need to be able to properly fund these facilities. I would like to know that we are going to work to achieve this. And if you would, would Senator Clements yield to a question or two? Senator Clements, will you yield? Yes. Senator Clements, you mentioned earlier that um, this could be and has the possibility to have a, a budget adjustment coming in, in coming years? Yes, I did. And the uh, first of all, the forecasting board has uh, given us a positive increase in revenue projections in the next two fiscal years. If those uh, come, if those hold true, we will have revenues to be able to consider uh, future provider increases, and I'm sure that we will uh, look at that next session with a budget adjustment. Thank you. Um, with that, uh, with the 3% this year and a possible 2% next year, um, do we feel that that is going to be adequate to cover the needs of these facilities, especially the 2% that we are talking about? I do, yes. And that's for fiscal year. The first fiscal year starts July 1. It goes to June 30th of 2024. We will be in session January of 2024 to be able to uh, look at that to make adjustments before July 1 of 2024 comes for the second fiscal year. Okay, th that one last question if I may. Um, if we make these readjustments in the following year, would the federal dollars matching funds still be available going forward with each fiscal year? Yes, yes, federal dollars. Um, there is a federal match. It's adjusted slightly each year, but the, uh, the match 
for Medicaid, according to the fund figures that I had, was uh, federal government was 66 percent of the total uh, funding on children, 71 percent. But that um, we um, we will be eligible for federal matching funds in the future. Okay, I appreciate that. Thank you, Mr. President. I yield back my time. Senator Wisher, you are recognized. Thank you, Mr. President. I had told Senator McDonnell I would yield him some time, but I am not seeing him, so I will take my time. I'll, I will yield my time to Senator McDonnell. Senator McDonald, four minutes, 30 seconds. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Senator Wishart. I'd like to talk about the, the process uh, for a moment. Um, there was some concern uh, by, by senators and, and the idea of, of this process. And, and when we were going through it, and this goes back to as a freshman in, in 2017, we had uh, looked at the governor's uh, vetoes and, and we decided to go a different direction as appropriations. And you've, you've got it in front of you and, and Senator Clements um, commented on it and gave it to you in, in writing, the process we went through with these, these overrides. Now, the governor had 22 uh, different um, vetoes. One of them was on, on Shovel Ready. And the idea of the governor and his team um, and their concerns going forward I, I understand their concerns. I don't, I don't agree with them. Based on the idea that we do mid-biennium adjustments. We will be back here and not trying to depress anybody. We'll be back here in seven months. And uh, you know, January's going to be a, a, an interesting time for, for all of us. Um, some of us, we will be going through our last 60 days. But for us as a state, it's going to be where are we at with our economy? Where are we at um, with some of the decisions we made within, within the budget? So if you, if you look at where we are uh, today and going through, and, and as I, I said about the idea of, of dropping shovel ready from 90 million to 70 million, I did not disagree um, with the governor on that. I did not um, bring that up in, in appropriations to make a motion, but the other, eight items that we had discussed in appropriations, I was definitely in disagreement with the governor. If you talk about provider rates, uh, where we are, and, and it was brought up that was the governor at 1.00, and then we got to three and two, and then did the governor come back and, and three with three and zero. So there was good discussion, and that, that is part of the process. But the idea of some senators being concerned on how the governor would, would react to this and us discussing the vetoes and potentially overriding his vetoes. I believe he you have to give him credit for understanding the process and, and knowing this is this is how the legislature works and this is how the appropriations process uh, works. And then and then it, whatever happens today, um, you know, we move on and and again we'll be back here in, in January. But I do believe we have shown the, the need uh, for the, the three and two on provider rates. Uh, you, can, you can all have those calls from your legislative districts that are, are telling you about the stories, the need, how this, this dollar, dollars would, would, would help. And I think we have to focus on that today and as we work through these, these other um, veto override discussions on how is it going to help our district? How is it going to help the state of Nebraska, east, west, north, south? And I want to focus on that because this is part of the process, but it's also about the people and the people that need this, that have reached out to us. And that's why we originally had it in, in the budget and going through this these last five months of preparing this budget and, and bringing it to you. Um, and that's why we feel strongly about it as Appropriations Committee. And I'm not saying the, the Four people that were opposed to it don't feel strongly about it, based on the idea of, of how do we how do we possibly do this mid biennium um, with the zero. But I think it, it is necessary for us to to override the governor on 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 this uh, uh, the provider rates, and I encourage you to vote uh, yes on the override. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Erdman, you are recognized. Thank you, Mr. President. Good morning. So I listened to the debate here this morning while we've been talking about, let me 
share something with you you may have forgotten or not thought about is the governor originally started out at zero, zero. And then he changed and accepted three, zero. So what we're talking about is next year's funding at 2%, the following year, 2%. And he went to zero. I hate to break the bad news to you, but in seven months, we're going to be back here. I know some of you didn't want to hear that, but that's the truth. We'll be back here in seven months. We'll then have an opportunity to look and see exactly what the 3% did to see if it needs to be adjusted going forward for the next year. And we can make those adjustments then. So it sounds like the sky is falling and everybody's going to close up if we don't override the veto. This will have no effect on this year. None. It's next year that we're talking about. And we'll have an opportunity to next year to work on the budget again. We always do. We make adjustments every year. The biggest adjustment we made was in 17 when we passed the budget. We were 250 million too high. In 18, we took back the 250. We made adjustments, and that's what we do. It's the second year of the biennium. biennium. So this isn't the end of the world. We'll get a chance to review this again. And in seven short, seven short months, we'll have an opportunity to add to whatever the appropriations needs to be to make people whole. So I understand the concerns out there, and I understand the issue we're going forward with. But be reassured, you're going to get the 3% this year, and it's the outlying year that you're concerned about and I believe that we'll make adjustments if we need to, to take care of those needs at that time. So I will not be voting to override the governor's veto. Thank you. Senator DeBoer, you are recognized. Thank you, Mr. President. Colleagues, I rise in support of provider rates for hospitals, um, both here and if we have to next year uh, when we were coming back to uh, the mid-biennium budget, because if we do not help our hospitals keep up with inflation, what happens? Well, for one thing, uh, some of those critical in-the-moment care options will still be available, so long as the hospital is available, if they can stay afloat. You know, we say, oh, well, People will stay afloat, they'll stay afloat. But we've seen what's happened with our long-term healthcare facilities in Nebraska. When I first came in here, uh, I attended the legislative council meeting before my first session. Technically, I didn't even know till that afternoon if I had won my race because they were still counting votes. But I remember distinctly a lot of things about that day, and one of them was that there was an interim study report about long-term health care facilities and how terrible the situation was becoming in Nebraska because so many were closing. The thing about Medicare provider rates is that if we do not adequately fund these folks, they just won't stay open. And these are things that we need throughout our state, not just in Omaha and Lincoln or Sarpy County, but throughout our state. The other issue is that individuals who provide non-emergency care may stop providing those particular types of care. If you can't make enough money on Medicaid or Medicare, then why would you provide those services? Which means fewer and fewer options for people to go to. We have a responsibility as the state to make sure that those who are providing these services are doing so in a way that they can at least get close to cutting even. Because if we do not, First of all, there will be a group of people who are unable to get care, and that's problematic. But the other thing is, if you're only worried about your own health care, I will tell you 
that it makes it more expensive when hospitals or other providers have to take a loss on some patients, they're going to have to raise costs on others. Otherwise, they can't make it work. So if we want to keep the whole system going, we've got to make sure that we are providing these rates for this class of individuals, this class of care, so that those folks who are providing these services are able to keep afloat. It's pretty much that simple. So I will support the override, and if it doesn't work out today, then next year I will support anything that we might do to help these folks get just a little closer to staying even with where they were a few years ago. We're actually decreasing our support to these folks as Medicaid or as in as a inflation. <laughs> One minute. Work. As inflation happens. So I urge you all to support the provider rates for all of our providers in Nebraska. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator McDonald, you are recognized to speak. Thank you, Mr. President. I will uh, yield the remainder of my time to Senator Vargas. I have nothing to say. Senator Vargas, will you yield to, oh. Senator Vargas, four minutes, 30. I'm gonna get Mike back for that someday. Um, <laughs> uh, colleagues, I support uh, the override motion on LB814. Um, I just wanted to reflect back on part of our, I think part of the responsibility as us individual senators, as members of the appropriation and that separate branch, uh, the separate branch of government that we all represent. Um, I understand that uh, hopefully people have been listening to the debate. And what I've heard even from individuals that might be against the override motion is I support the idea for some of the indiv individuals, I support the funding. Um, I don't know if necessarily now is the right time or I might want to do it next year. Um, my, my ask is to consider the message we send, um, and I, before I said to children and families and seniors, which that's separate right now, but the message we're also sending to the institutions that are providing the health care um, to those seniors and to the children and to families, specifically low-income families. Uh, there's a reason why we do our mid -biennium, our biennium budget the way that we do. The reason we do it is particularly to make sure that we are being able to budget for these two years. We're not doing it every single year. It's much more cumbersome to do it that way. And it's a important message in terms of operations and stability and consistency that we also send to the healthcare systems that they're receiving funds and can rely on these funds for the two years and can plan appropriately. But doing it only for the year, and that is an issue that was presented and that I spoke on, just there's a need for consistency, there's a need to make sure that we're doing that. Uh, and for me, the other big thing is, is still on the lost federal funds. Um, you know, the, the way that we look at different programs, sometimes we're looking at cost savings when we are sustaining an override. But the way I look at it is we are going to be losing on federal funds that are matching these general funds we put forward. This is an ability for us to better leverage those taxpayer dollars that uh, the federal government has coming back to us. It's one of the reasons why the voters supported Medicaid expansion. It's because we want to make sure that those taxpayer dollars are going to good use. These programs for Medicaid and CHIP are important ones for making sure we're addressing poverty, making sure we're reducing the uninsured rate across, uh, across the state, our uninsured rate for children, making sure that we are supporting our workforce so that that access is available all across the state. And by not, not overriding this, we are saying, you have to pick up the tab in the second year. You have to figure out how to make it work. And I think we have a responsibility, just like the things that I've supported on, on the mic. I've said about the Education Future Fund. I've mentioned already about the funds for the water infrastructure and for the canal. Many, of, and then the tax cuts that we, that we supported, which I also voted for, 
but we also have a responsibility to take care of children and families and making sure the institutions that the access is available to these individuals across our state. We have a responsibility to do that and missing out on federal funds is something that is not a message I want to be sending to our constituents. That we actually leverage our taxpayer dollars coming back to us so we can put it to good use. We're not talking about starting a new program. We're not talking about expanding the population. We're not talking about any of that. We're talking about whether or not we can sustain our workforce in oh, urban man. and rural Nebraska and everything in between so that we have people to provide the services to our lowest income individuals. That's what this is about. And I know for some of us that have been on the committee for years, the reason why we're also supporting this is we've seen what happens when we don't support the workforce. We've seen the closures that happen in long-term care facilities. We've seen more of the big hospital institutions taking on more of the coverage of the cost of the Medicaid rates. They're taking it out of their own pockets. And then they rely on philanthropy, but there's only so much that can be done in that regard. Anywhere between 15 to 25 percent of increase in labor costs, in contracting costs, in supply costs, that has been happening over the last couple of years. So it's going to cost more to do the same work. So keeping it Time flat. Center. Thank you. Senator Vargas, you are next in the queue. Thank you. So keeping it flat has, yeah, that, that's on you. Uh, keeping it flat is, is the problem that we're running, our, running into because they have increased costs. And by keeping this rate flat, we are telling them you have to pick up wherever you can. And colleagues, I think we have a responsibility, just like we have been doing investments, responsibility to do as much as we possibly can to give taxpayer, taxpayers their money back like we've done this session, but also utilize the taxpayer funds that we have received for basic services that we know are working and have oversight over our executive branch. And our executive branch has oversight through DHHS and the work that they do here. I want that taxpayer money to come back to us and I wanna make sure it's leveraged to good use for our workforce. In rural communities, this is going to impact even more the access, and I think we've heard that. I heard it from Senator Jacobson. You know, he may not be in support of it right now, but I did hear that, and I really appreciated that, that reflection that this isn't gonna impact my district. It's absolutely gonna impact my district. But I'm not entirely sure that the money or the will will be there in the previous year, in the next year. And so we plan for these biennium budgets. We're not treating every other agency or line item where we're cutting it in the second year and then coming back to see what happens. We should be treating this like we treat 99% of the rest of our budget, which is fulfilling what we worked on in the floor here or on the floor here and also in committee and appropriations and funding the full budget for these provider rates. So colleagues, I ask you to override uh, and support LB 814 in this motion 1150. Thank you very much. Senator Dover, you're recognized. I was a yes vote on the 3% increase for the first year and the 2% increase for the second year in the initial vote in the Appropriations Committee. The governor agrees with the 3% for the first year and not the second 2% for the second year and hence the veto. I appreciate Senator Jacobson's interim study of rebasing Medicaid. That is exactly what we need to be doing. We need to address the challenges to Nebraska healthcare system and especially nursing homes in rural Nebraska. I believe we need to work together with the governor on finding a long-term solution. I ask you to vote no to override the governor's veto and look to gaining more information on this problem. Again, if you do not override the veto, we still have time to address the second fiscal year after having a deeper look into this challenging problem. In an ending, I would ask you to consider that voting to override may just be locking in the wrong solution for the second year. The health care challenge is real, and we need to make sure that we are addressing it with the right decision. Thank you. Senator Conrad, you are recognized. 
Thank you, Mr. President. Good morning, colleagues. Uh, I appreciate the thoughtful and informative dialogue we've had in regards to this issue thus far this morning. And I wanted to add some additional thoughts to perhaps provide a counterpoint to some of my friends who are looking to the future in order to identify other solutions to address our shared commitment to ensuring a strong healthcare safety net in Nebraska. Um, and I think my friend Senator Jacobson and then Senator Dover, my friend Senator Dover just touched upon this as well. And I want to make sure the counterpoint is clear in terms of perhaps uh, a helpful lens and then also specific detail as to the timing of that approach and the detrimental um, effects if we only uh, look to future opportunities to work together instead of committing to do that and um, take up this modest increase in critical health care services at the present time. So I think that it, my perspective is this is not an either or, but this should be a yes and. We're looking at modest increases that are below the needs, that are below inflation to address health care costs now in each and every one of our communities. The providers from children, those who provide children's health insurance to those that provide critical access through our hospital systems, they have been crystal clear in regards to their needs today. Those needs have been identified, debated, deliberated upon from an arduous committee process and three rounds of debate that we collectively took together on our budget. In recognition that those modest increases were already going to lead to potential detrimental effects in our healthcare system in Nebraska. So we can and we should and we must override the veto in regards to our commitment to each other, the institution, our constituents and healthcare. And we must commit to work with our full diligence in interim studies, in upcoming rebasing, or other sort of assessments to ensure that we are modernizing and right-sizing our approach to healthcare financing. And let's talk a little bit more about the timing. So in this first year of the biennial budget, these provider rates increases would, of course, then start to take effect starting in July 1 and carrying forward. An interim study will happen over the interim, and it does not have any clear commitment to what the future may hold. It is a commitment to continue to talk and to continue to study, and that is important, but it is just that. It's limited in terms of its impact. When we look at rate studies, when we look at rebasing studies, colleagues, it's important to acknowledge in many instances, these kinds of systematic reviews take 12 to 18 months to complete. So in many instances, those processes will not even be complete before we complete our short session together next year. So it's important to be thoughtful about the timing and to remember why it's important to approach this as a yes and. Yes to modest increases that don't even meet the needs of our health care providers today and a commitment to work together through interim studies and rebasing and rate studies so that we can right size and modernize our approach for the future. And let's just take it from a practical perspective. Thank you, Mr. President. An interim study is important. A rebasing is important. A race study is important. They do not bring a doctor back who leaves a rural community. They do not provide an opportunity to buy Band-Aids and supplies and other necessary healthcare items today. We need to take a yes and approach. We need to ensure a modest commitment today and a thoughtful, deeper, comprehensive commitment for our health care opportunities tomorrow. It shouldn't be an either or. It should be a yes and. That's how we can advance our shared commitment to ensuring a healthy Nebraska. Thank you, Mr. President.
Senator Michaela Cavanaugh, you're recognized to speak. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, colleagues, I am probably not going to vote for the motion to override uh, the, the rates for our hospitals, primarily because I haven't heard from anyone in the medical community on this motion to override. And so I am struggling to find a reason that it would be necessary. I, I, do, I am concerned about the financial well-being of our state. And I think that there are things that have been vetoed that we should be overriding. And I would consider this in that list if it weren't for the fact that no one impacted by it has spoken to me about it. So I'm inclined to think that it's not actually that important to the uh, health and well-being of our healthcare institutions. Otherwise, they probably would have been discussing it over the last several days, starting with last week. So I've seen all of them out there. Uh, I've been out there numerous times, and no one has approached me on this particular topic. And so I'm probably going to be present not voting on motion 1150. Um, but I do intend to vote for some of the other overrides because I, I don't agree with the governor on, on some of his overrides. And I don't particularly agree with this one, but um, I just assume that if you're not advocating for it to be overridden, then it's probably not essential. So there we go. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Fredrickson, you are recognized. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, I rise in support of this uh, motion to override. Um, you know, I think this has been a really compelling discussion. I've appreciated hearing folks' perspectives from uh, both sides of this issue. For me, you know, I, and this might sound kind of an unusual statement to make as an urban-based senator, but one of the things that um, has been particularly compelling to me is the concerns that have been outlined uh, that, that specifically related to our rural health care um, and also how this is potentially going to impact aging Nebraskans throughout our state, obviously, um, that includes areas like Omaha and Lincoln, but this is also, I think, really going to uh, have the potential to have a really negative impact on uh, our aging population in the rural parts of our state. You know, we've talked a lot about uh, broadband expansion this year. Um, we talked a lot about infrastructure that is going to improve um, ways we deploy um, access to information as well as healthcare. And one thing that I've certainly learned in my own uh, clinical practice uh, since I've started doing telehealth is how much of a need there is for healthcare workforce and specifically behavioral healthcare workforce in the western part of our state. And uh, being able to provide uh, telehealth care to folks in those areas has been really transformational um, in, in, in many ways. And so um, I, I do have concerns about the potential impact that this might have on further uh, decreasing um, and negatively impacting the rates of population to providers in the western part of our state. Uh, and I want to be supportive of folks, uh, Nebraskans, in all areas of our state. So that is a big concern of mine. I, I've also heard, uh, you know, a uh, few folks on the mic mentioned that, you know, they want to support the governor, they want to support the governor. And, you know, I think that that's all very well intentioned, and I think it's important to do. And at the same time, I, I also want to reiterate that, you know, we can also disagree on issues, and that doesn't necessarily mean that you are not supportive um, or, or not friends. Um, you know, I've had uh, plenty of uh, policy disagreements with a number of folks in here, uh, and I think that that is, you know, good legislation, good policy making doesn't mean that we always agree on everything. And so, um, you know, it's okay to not always go along to get along, so to speak. And I actually think that's what leads to the best policy uh, outcome. So I will go, I will be opposing, uh, or I'm sorry, I will be supporting uh, the motion to override this, um, as I underscored earlier, specifically as it relates to uh, the rural parts of the state. That's been one of my primary concerns here. Thank you, Mr. President. Seeing no one left in the queue, Senator Clements, you're welcome to close on your motion. Thank you, Mr. President. I appreciate the conversation and the debate. It's been um, good to hear, and I um, still 
oppose the motion. I ask for your no vote on the override. It's uh, interesting to support the governor's veto. You have to vote no to make that clear. It can be confusing. Uh, again, the um, providers are getting the amount from the budget to 3% with no reduction. They're just not getting an extra 2% the second year, but the 3% in the first year carries forward to the second year. And for the children's health insurance, 677000 in each year, uh, bringing up to $23.2 million. The uh, other Medicaid programs, the increase is $21.5 .5 million per year, which is in the budget, will, will be provided as an increase, bringing the state general funds up to $739.8 million. Um, so the, the two years of 21.5 is about $44 million of additional over two years, and it's just a decrease of $14.7 million with the possibility of being revisited next year. And um, with the federal match, we are going to be providing $2.179 billion uh, per year. And I was corrected, in the number of Medicaid recipients is about 380,000 which is $5,735 per person per year, um, providing $2.179, $2.1 billion a year for uh, people on Medicaid is uh, adequate in my, in my opinion. And I think the governor has been uh, good with negotiating, with meeting a middle ground, starting at zero and increasing to 3% with no reduction in the first year. So I do ask you for a no vote on motion 1150 to support the governor's override. And I ask for a call of the house, Mr. Speaker. There has been a request to place the house under call. The question is, shall the house go under call? All those in favor vote aye, all those opposed vote nay. Mr. Clerk. 23 A's, three nays, place house under call, Mr. President. The house is under call. Senators, please record your presence. Those unexcused senators outside the chamber, please return to the chamber and record your presence. All unauthorized personnel, please leave the floor. The house is under call. Senator Bostar, please return to the chamber. The House is under call. All unexcused members are now present. The question before the body is the passing of motion 1150. All those in favor vote aye, all those opposed vote nay.
Mr. Clerk, please record. 22 A's, 24 nays. Mr. President, on the motion to override. Motion is unsuccessful. I raise the call. Mr. Clerk, next item. Mr. President, next item, motion override on LB 814, override the governor's line item veto in section 254 Agency 27, Department of Economic Development Program 601, Community and Rural Development. Senator Clements, you're welcome to open on motion 1151. Thank you, Mr. President. Motion 1151 regards rural and middle income workforce housing. It includes community and rural, rural development. It's item number two on the committee report that I handed out. You can see the sections involved. And we had five yes votes, four no votes. And so it did carry forward to be presented to you. The, uh, let's see, the appropriations for rural and middle income housing combined are being re reduced by $20 million in fiscal year 24 and 20, and $20 million in fiscal year 25. It's $10 million for each of those. And uh, there is going to be a, later on at the bottom of the committee report, you'll see an LB 818, a companion motion to override the cash reserve fund transfer, which funds this appropriation. That'll be addressed when we move to LB 818, the cash reserve bill. Um, the, uh, so that's, that was the committee report. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Aguilar, you are recognized to speak. Thank you, Mr. Pre President. Good morning, colleagues and fellow Nebraskans. I rise in support of the motion to override the governor's line item veto for the Rural Workforce Housing Fund and the Middle Workforce Housing Fund. Two years ago, I was in a me meeting with members of the Grand Island Chamber of Commerce. We were talking about a legislative path forward coming out of the pandemic. At the end of the meeting, one of the members said, Senator, we need three things from you in order to move our economy forward. We need infrastructure, infrastructure, infrastructure. Most importantly, we need housing. If we have housing, we can bring in workers. If we have workers, we can create jobs and grow our economy. It's that simple. We have debated a lot of bills this session where we have talked about how much we are spending in the state. We've asked time and time again how much something costs. Many times when we ask this, we really don't have an idea what our return on the investment will be. And sometimes we don't exactly know when the seeds we plant will bear fruit. This is definitely not the case with the Rural Workforce Housing Fund and the Middle Workforce Housing Fund. This is a situation where it is prudent for our state to spend money in order to make money. For the past several days, you have been all receiving emails and possibly phone calls from organizations who could use these funds. These are forward-thinking organizations who know how to make the most of these funds. Take the time to read some of these emails and you will see that we have already been hard, they have already been hard at work developing projects all over the state. This is not simply a pet project for a, by a handful of senators. This is an investment in Nebraska's workforce. The workers that will use this housing are the backbone of Nebraska's workforce in the upcoming decades. Part of the future of Nebraska's economy will be based on this relatively small investment. Putting our workers and their families first shows a commitment to Nebraska's traditional core values. We have companies that are willing to work to help make this housing a reality. Now we need to show them that Nebraska is a worker-friendly state by putting forth the money and the innovative spark necessary to help jumpstart this development. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Lippincott, you're recognized. Thank you, sir. I agree with uh, what Ray Aguilar just said a few moments ago. And I would like to look at uh, Grand Island in particular. And uh, a lot of us have high ideals in terms of how government should work. And for the most part, I'm certainly a 
uh, free enterprise kind of guy. I believe in supply and demand. But let's look specifically at Grand Island. In 1971, when we used to win national championships, the population of Grand Island was half of what it is today, 25,000 people. And at 25,000 people, it had 970 homes for sale, almost 1,000. 25,000 people, 1,000 homes for sale. Today, the population of Grand Island is almost 60,000 people, and the number of homes for sale today for $250,000 or less is 16, less than 20. That's a lot less than 1,000 homes that we had back in 1971. So we do have an issue, supply and demand. And homes today have, on average, 2.5 persons per home versus back in 1970, it was 3.14. So it's dropped almost a quarter in terms of the household size. Same population, more homes for the same population. So let's run that down into the numbers. If you have a town that has 10,000 homes in 1970, it would now need 12,000 500 homes today. So the dynamics have changed. <clears throat> also, for all the folks here, like Rob Dover and others that are in the housing industry, they all know about the 1% rule, the law of entropy, and that is homes just naturally wear out. And they figure that in 10 years, you'll have to replace approximately 10% of the houses with new homes because they wear out. So that's an issue that you need to think about. Nebraska currently has 776,000 homes, so 1%, you're going to have to build 7,760 homes per year just due to the fact that homes naturally wear out. And then we have what happened back in 2008 with the Great Recession. Nationally, we have 5 million homes fewer than we had a decade ago that are being built. So the building process has slowed down. Nebraska, specifically our state, before 2008 was giving 900 building permits per month, 900. Now, after the 2008 housing debacle, it's now 400. So it's less than half. <clears throat> and then finally, you need to look at, we just talked about the problems, now the solution, the rural workforce housing versus federal programs. And of course, there's a lot of brouhaha about, well, there's money available right now that's in the pipeline that's not being used. That's not necessarily true regarding the federal programs. The federal programs have income restrictions, which limits its ability to go out and help people. The federally funded housing is almost entirely with seniors and disabled people. And of course, what we're talking about is workforce. So seniors and disabled people would fall outside that realm. And federally funded housing does not directly address One our minute. workforce needs. <clears throat> These restrictions have made it very difficult for a Department of Economic Development to administer these funds and get the money deployed. Whereas with the rural workforce housing, that's not income restricted to be tailored to meet the needs of each community's workforce. The administration is done at the local level and DED, Department of Economic Development, is able to efficiently deploy this money. Last point, and that is builders, what they do is they build large homes with large profit margins versus small homes. We need more smaller homes. Thank you, sir. Senator Erdman, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. President. I am not going to vote to override the governor's veto. And for anybody who's listened to my comments in the past will not be surprised that I'm not for the government building houses, not one. If you have a work shortage, a workforce shortage, and the housing is not available, build one. 
in rural Nebraska, the agricultural world and ranching and farming, if we're looking for an employee to be on our ranch or our farm, we provide housing for them. I have yet to see a place in any constitution or any of the United States or Nebraska that says it's a state's obligation to build houses. We're in a free market enterprise system. I'm going to give you an example. In Gordon, Nebraska, they have a meat packing plant there. They had a shortage of housing for their workers. And the plant bought or refurbished, remodeled at least 12 homes in Gordon to furnish their workers a place to live. That's how it's supposed to work. And people say, well, the communities are making a contribution and they add that to the government money and then they build a house. We should be building that with our own personal dollars. And it's really easy for government to use tax dollars to do things for the public because it's easy to spend somebody else's money. So if you have a shortage of housing, then build a house for them. That's how that works. But that's not what we do here. So I don't know what you call that building houses by the government, but it's not what I intend to do with tax dollars that people have contributed to the state. But that's what we want to do. And then we talk about house workforce housing shortage or middle income housing shortage. And the reason that contractors don't build those houses is because it's not economically feasible. So they build more expensive or larger homes and they make more money. So the issue is, how do we solve the problem? Is the government the solution? Is the government the solution to build houses? Or should it be a free enterprise system where a house is needed, someone builds one and puts an employee in there? And it's part of their compensation. So I will not be voting to override the governor's veto. And I've never been in the past, nor will I be in the future, in favor of the government building houses. Thank you. Senator Brandt, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. President. I stand in support of the uh, overriding uh, the governor's veto, uh, echoing what Senator Aguilar and Senator Lippincott said. Um, so I talked to one of our local bankers in Exeter and I says, what kind of effect does this have? And in the last year in Fillmore County, uh, we had uh, three rehab projects and three new construction, uh, five of those in Geneva, and I guess one was in Deschler, which is their county. And then we've got two more in the pipeline. And these are projects that would run through the Southeast Nebraska Development District, uh, and they're committed to doing the work in, in District 32. But if you extrapolate that to uh, all four of my counties down there, it'd be about 24, 25 projects on an annual basis. The realities in rural Nebraska are this. A lot of our small towns don't have lumber yards. You have to bring building materials in uh, from a distance away. You have to bring building crews in from a distance away. So when those individuals leave Lincoln, let's say they're coming out of Lincoln and they have to drive an hour, an hour and a half, you're paying full salary to those people and they aren't doing anything until they get on the work site. Uh, it is very expensive to build in rural Nebraska. This is a program that helps uh, those situations. The inverse of that is our salaries tend to be less than what the urban areas do. This has been a very popular and successful program. When I look at the what was vetoed in this and what wasn't in the budget, and I see that our friends in Omaha have $30 million uh, for some fields up there around Creighton University, and then we knock out $40 million on workforce housing that goes across the whole state. Um, I, am, I am definitely gonna support the override 
to help provide housing uh, for rural and middle income across the state of Nebraska. Thank you. Senator Vargas, you are recognized. Good morning, colleagues. Appreciate you coming to this conversation with an open mind. And hopefully you heard Senator Aguilar's points and Senator Lippincott's points. And I'd like to specifically speak to all of you about the housing elements contained in this override. I support the override motion, both for the funding for rural workforce housing and middle income workforce housing that were cut from our budget. Here's the reason why I support this. Workforce housing is housing that meets the needs of working families. Many people think of Workforce housing is just affordable housing, and there are different affordable housing programs. This is a very specific tailored set of programs, and I think that's important because the development of these middle income housing options would lead to the recruitment and retention of a workforce in Nebraska's urban communities. Now, Nebraska's housing market plays a critical role in realizing the economic potential for our state and supporting a high quality of life for all Nebraskans. A healthy and robust housing market facilitates job growth, generational transitions, stability of real estate and land values, and access to quality housing options across our state's population. Now, the reason why I share this is because the Rural Workforce Housing Program was signed into law in 2017 by Governor Pete Ricketts as part of the Rural Workforce Housing Investment Act. The Rural Workforce Housing Program provides competitive matching grants to nonprofit development organizations who are administer workforce housing investment funds. The funds are invested in eligible projects to increase the supply and reduce the cost of workforce housing in Nebraska's rural communities. Uh, this was a big part of not only Governor Ricketts' um, initiative on rural workforce development, it was also something that we looked at and studied the economic impact from the planning committee. And more importantly, you'll see in a handout of the supporters of workforce housing uh, and all the different supporters that are listed there of workforce housing. The Middle Income Workforce Housing Fund was created in 2020, uh, and it was under the Middle Income Workforce Housing Act to supply matching grants to nonprofit development organizations that administer local workforce housing investment funds. This is a mirror program of the Rural Workforce Housing Program that was working so successfully. And these funds are awarded for investment into Nebraska's older urban and higher minority neighborhoods in Douglas, Lancaster, and Sarpy County. This is into all those three counties. Now, the reason we brought this and the reason why I voted to override the governor on this is because of the work that was done in some of the housing studies, and some of you attended this session at the beginning of this legislative session about housing affordability. Housing is unaffordable right now. 44% of Nebraskan households who earn 75,000 per year or less spend more than 30% of their gross income on housing. 30% of their gross income is on housing, leaving them less money for necessities and reducing their ability to contribute to the economy and build personal wealth. There is insufficient diverse housing. An analysis of the statewide shortage shows that there's 32,230 rental units for renters with less than $20,000 in household income. The inadequate, safe, and diverse housing options across Nebraska leads to a limited workforce for employers and less vibrant communities, especially for middle-income Nebraskans, seniors, veterans, and those with disabilities. I think we can agree that the success of our state depends on solving this housing crisis we are currently experiencing, rapidly increasing home sales and rental prices, some of which Senator Lippincott mentioned, and issues with quality and quantity of available housing inventory have become a barrier to job growth, community development, town attraction, retention, and overall quality of life for Nebraska and its communities. The stakes really can't be overstated. As the recent statewide strategic housing framework report put it, our state's competitiveness and economic future hinge on solving the housing crisis. You'll also get a handout that was just, that was just handed out that shows some of the housing projects, the most recent ones that were done for the rural workforce housing, since that one has a longer amount of time of being in, in sort of a successful program. And you'll see by many of the senators and the project recipients, the leveraging of these local 
solutions to middle income and workforce housing. This is not an ongoing program where we fund it every single year in the budget. This is when we fund it. It is extremely nimble. It is successful in that own right. And is separate from all the other affordable housing programs that exist. We're talking about workforce housing and meeting that middle ground to grow the middle class and, and make sure we're doing everything we can. I'll get on the mic and talk a little bit more about this, but I wanted to make sure what we're talking about is workforce housing and not the affordable housing programs we've been talking about and that the need is inherent. And I'm thankful that all these supporters, the Chambers of Thanks, Commerce, Senator. League of Municipalities support it. Thank you. Senator Raybould, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. President. I really do appreciate the comments of Senator Senators Aguilar, Lippincott, Brandt, and, and Vargas because they're spot on. Affordable housing is not affordable these days, uh, not anywhere in our country, actually. And, you know, there are so many driving factors to that. Interest rates are increasing, inflation rates increasing, supply delays and increasing in the cost of materials, equipment, especially transformers and electrical panels are 300 days out that also contribute to not allowing those who know how to do affordable and workforce housing. And we also heard mention skilled labor. Senator Brandt is spot on. The cost of getting skilled labor subcontractors to the rural communities has a cost plus on it because they're coming out of Lincoln and Omaha and Norfolk and other larger communities, Grand Island as well. And so these contributed, contribute greatly to the increase in cost and making everything unaffordable. And what I'm hearing from those companies that do do affordable and workforce housing is they need that funding gap. They have a gap. They look to the Nebraska Investment Finance Agency for assistance on helping them make that financing gap as they're struggling with the workforce cost increase, material cost increase, and just trying to get a project done. And I wanted to address something about the Department of Economic Development. I, I travel around the state. We have grocery stores around the state. And I hear it from every single community. And Governor Pillen, if you're listening, Columbus is asking and begging for both affordable and workforce housing. How do I know? I'm the, up there a lot. Um, and But it's true in every single community that we have grocery stores in, from Minden to Loop City to Behatris and to Columbus, everywhere in our state. And this is what those folks that do uh, affordable housing and workforce housing tell me. You know, they work with so many pots of financing. They work with LIHTC, which is low income housing tax credits. They work with the Nebraska Affordable Housing Trust Fund. They work with NeighborWorks. They partner with the nonprofits because that can allow them to have access to additional pots of funding. They work with NIFA. They work with anyone they can to make sure that they can get this project to succeed. So it's, it's not such a simple equation like, oh, we're giving the money to them. Even in Lincoln, Nebraska, we cannot keep up with the demand of creating additional workforce housing. And I know probably a little bit is because we're getting a lot of rural, rural residents moving to Lincoln and Omaha, which we do appreciate. But that means we can't abandon our rural communities because you should look on it, as I've said before, is economic reinvestment in our rural communities. We want them to be sustainable. We want them to be viable. And this is a tremendous need. Don't listen to me. Don't listen to me about it. Listen to the Nebraska Chamber of Commerce. What are their top three fundamental issues that the state of Nebraska needs to jump on? Workforce, absolutely. Affordable housing, and then childcare, childcare. Senator Vargas told about how 30% or more of your income goes towards your housing budget. That's significant. The next big chunk of that is childcare for those working families. And we know in our state of Nebraska, demographically, both parents have to work outside the home. And that is very costly. So if we want to retain, attract, and keep our population in our state One of Nebraska, minute. this this should be a slam dunk. And 
For those folks that don't get out much, you really need to get out and listen to your communities. The, the rural communities, I think they get it, they understand this is a huge need. And the cost of getting the subcontractors to come out there, deliver the materials, it's an added on cost. So please, please override this veto. This is a desperately needed thing to reinvest in our rural communities. Thank you very much. Senator McDonald, you're recognized. Excuse me. Mr. Clerk for items. Mr. President, my name is quickly. Explanation of vote regarding the final passage of Legislative Bill 138 from Senator Slama. Additionally, bills presented to the governor this morning, LVs 138E, 138AE, 298, and 298A were presented to the governor at 9.55 a.m. And notice that the Judiciary Committee will meet under the South Balcony at 1130 for an executive session. Judiciary, South Balcony, 1130 exec session. That's all I have this time, Mr. President. Senator McDonald, you are now recognized. Thank you, Mr. President. I did a, I, I just, uh, the pages brought around a, a handout. Um, I'd like you to take a look at it. I, I don't want people to get confused of what we're talking about between affordable housing is, is definitely different than workforce housing. And and as Senator Aguilar started off by, by speaking about the economic development of that. And what do we look like as a state going forward, and we know there's the population and trying to retain and recruit people in the in the state of Nebraska, but also there's been a shift. If you look at us looking from the west to the east, and if we were looking as, as a lifeboat, we're all shifted to one side of the state, and um, therefore we tip and, and we, we, we all drowned. The idea that if we look at our state to maintain and, and um, increase, we need workforce housing. And just to make sure that you understand about when you look at the handout, I don't want you to get confused with the difference between rural workforce housing and middle income workforce housing with the Nebraska Affordable Housing, ARPA Workforce Housing, Economic Recovery Act Housing, the National Housing Trust, uh, Home ARPA. There's so much people have said, well, we've got millions, hundreds of millions of dollars, well over $200 million we're talking about with housing. But that's where we differ because that is affordable housing. That is definitely needed. But we're talking about workforce housing, and I want to make sure it is estimated that we will need between 30 and 50,000 workforce housing level homes units developed by 2030. This is in our state. Just to make sure we understand, 30 to 50,000. Even at current funding levels, we will fall short of this need. The rural workforce housing and middle income housing programs were created to fill this specific need and shouldn't be lumped in with the use of affordable housing trust fund. Do the math. Assume that the funds are being used in, for low income interest loans and can be um, and can be regenerated as those loans are paid off. Even at the lowest level of funding, 125,000, let's use that as our low end, 40 million will only cover the cost of that development of 320 homes and uh, slash units. With that average cost of, of homes in Nebraska hovering around $300,000, but we are using the low number of 125,000. Workforce housing funding requirements. New owner occupied housing costs no more than 325,000. New rental housing units costing no more than 250,000. Owner occupied or rental housing units for which the cost is substantially um, related exceeds and doesn't exceed 50% of the, the unit's assessed value. Upper story housing. Um, it, the, the list is, and I'm going to make sure everyone has a copy of this, and then you get into middle income housing funding re requirements. Construction of new, new owner occupied housing has to have an uh, after construction appraised value of 125000 and not more than 330000 Owner occupied housing units for which the cost is substantially uh, ex does not exceed 50% of the units before construction assessed value. Um, upper story housing occupant, occup occupant uh, occupation by a homeowner. Um, eligible areas limited to the city of, of, of Lincoln or qualified census tracts, which does not include um, Douglas or, or Sarpy counties as described uh, earlier in the handout. So make sure that we're talking about we have a need and don't get confused with the number of dollars that are out in front of you that are not for the idea of, of workforce worse housing. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Wisher, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. President. I rise in support of the motion to override the veto on the investments we made this year on housing. 
Colleagues, I often repeat this statistic because it is one that I think about every day when I'm coming into the state capitol. By 2030, our state is facing a population that is going to be a majority 65 and older and fewer people that are than, than people who are 18 and younger. Think about that. More people in our state are going to be leaving our workforce and retiring than we have entering into the workforce by 2030. Ask any Chamber of Commerce director, we have over 80,000 job openings across our state. 80,000 jobs that we cannot fill in our state. And now we're looking at a population that is continuing to age into retirement and not a younger population in our state that's either coming to our state or staying in our state to fill those positions. And then you look at our housing needs. 50,000 plus across the state units needed. 10,000 alone in Lincoln. We are 10,000 units short in Lincoln for what we anticipate our population to be. Our goal is by 2030 to have at least 5,000 more units built to meet the demands of a population in Lincoln. When I look at all of these statistics and I think about what we as a legislature should be prioritizing our time and our investments in as a state, housing should absolutely be at the top of that list. It solves a lot of these crises we're talking about. It, it is an anchor for young people to come, to grow a family, to build their career. It is an economic development tool for communities that decide across our state, we are, we are going to grow and we're going to exist as a community. And I really applaud Grand Island in particular for filling the rotunda today and for the amount of work and, and emphasis they have put into supporting economic development projects like building workforce housing. I applaud those communities across the state and you know them and you see them when you drive through them that have made a commitment that we are going to thrive as a community. And one of those commitments that's central to that, whenever I see a community that's thriving, is that they're growing their housing. They're not only growing affordable housing, but they're also growing workforce housing so that they can say to the next business that wants to grow or come into their community, we have the places for your employees to live and raise their families, live their lives, Colleagues, we need to make a stand today in prioritizing housing because this is a priority that is going to help us solve a lot of the challenges we have in front of us as a state. And so I encourage you to support us in, in overriding this veto. Thank you. Senator Breezy, you are recognized. Thank you, Mr. President. Good morning, colleagues. I'm going to speak briefly to the rural workforce housing uh, component that we're talking about here. And I, I realize the importance of housing to economic growth in our state. And I think, you know, my family lived the issue here the last six months or so. I think I've described that to some of you, not gonna describe it today. But it's my understanding that we have some unused funds in that program. Uh, would Senator Clements yield to a question? Senator Clements, will you yield? Yes, I would. Thank you, Senator Clements. According to the language of, I believe it's LB 814, uh, unused dollars in the Rural Workforce Housing Fund are to be reappropriated to that fund and will stay in the fund. Is that correct? Yes, I have page 132 in my hand. The unexpended cash fund for rural workforce housing investment existing on June 30th of 2023 is hereby reappropriated. That section is not vetoed. Okay, how many dollars are we talking about there? I checked with the fiscal office yesterday. There are unobligated rural housing funds of $8 million that will carry forward to fiscal year 24. $8 million? Yes. Okay, Th thank you very much, uh, Senator Clements. I appreciate that. And so we had a, a budget request here, or the Appropriations Committee set aside $10 million and $10 million to the Rural Workforce Housing Fund. And so for the first year, the 
reappropriated dollars essentially gets us to 80% of what we're talking about here. And as far as the second year is concerned, we could come back with a biennium adjustment if we're running out of dollars in the fund and attempt to uh, get more dollars in there. And I would be supportive of that. And I would likely introduce a bill to do that uh, if the fund is dwindling by then. But maybe one of my biggest concerns is this. Everything we do in this body relative to dollars is interrelated. Dollars going into one program can lead to subtractions in another program. And we need to remember that, especially as we put in place a transformative measure of school funding, funding reform and an historic measure of tax reform. For me, those are the measures that have the greatest beneficial impact for the broadest array of Nebraskans. And I believe tax relief should be the number one goal of this body. It benefits every segment of our economy, has the most widespread economic impact. It will generate economic growth. The tax and education funding reform plans need to be protected. And that likely means sustaining the governor's vetoes throughout. And again, with workforce housing, housing in general, we have some unused funds that will roll over and we can come back in January to, to make an adjustment. And I'm more than willing to do so. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Hughes, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. President. I rise in support of this override. The Rural Workforce Housing Investment Act, LB 518, was signed into law in 2017, as was mentioned before. These funds invested in our rural communities through the Rural Workforce Housing Program provide a vital function. They support affordable housing for our workforce. If you drive into the city of Seward in District 24, you would think there's not a shortage of housing due to all the many new homes being built. However, these new homes cost in excess of $400,000 and are out of reach for a significant percentage of our workforce. Under the rural workforce housing, new owner-occupied housing can cost no more than $325,000 and new rental units cannot cost more than $250,000. If you go further west into York County, which is also in District 24, you can stop in and talk to the York County Development Corporation. They will share with you that countywide, they need more than 550 housing units within the next seven years. Currently, there are about 10 a year being built. A recent award there will fund affordable housing in the city of York, as well as in the city of Henderson. Colleagues, these rural workforce housing funds are for housing projects that are not eligible for any other source of funding. And why is this important? Governor Pillen stated in the me message to the legislature that over the past three years, more than 200 million has been invested in, af in affordable housing in Nebraska, and that he wished to avoid flooding the housing market with government subsidization. Of the more than 200 million mentioned since 2021, only 40 million has been given for rural workforce housing. All those other dollars mentioned in the, in the Nebraska Affordable Housing Fund, the AR, ARPA Workforce Housing Fund, the National Housing Trust Fund, or HOME, all capitalized funds, are not available to projects being funded by the Rural Workforce Housing Program. This program is the only tool we have to incentivize the construction of affordable housing units in our rural communities. The program is not one where we are throwing taxpayer money into a vacuum. Local communities have to show a need and have to have skin in the game. Communities must provide a recent or recently updated housing study to, divine, to define the need for the affordable workforce housing. And communities must also provide a minimum of 50% in matching funds in order to qualify. So in order to participate, a community must demonstrate a need and put up their own money before they can even apply. When they do apply, communities have to submit a letter of intent detailing specifically how the funds will be used. Once funds are awarded, communities have to submit annual reports to the Department of Economic Development. Colleagues, the Rural Workforce Housing Program is the one program that 90 of our counties rely upon for affordable workforce housing. Douglas, Lancaster, and Sarpy counties have other programs, but this program is all that Greater Nebraska has to use. Please support the motion override.
I also wanted to mention some specifics. For Seward County, the first round of rural workforce housing funding, including matching funds, totaled $1.26 million. This $1.26 million will create $15.7 million in investment through construction of 91 new housing units, including the first development in Utica in over two decades, as well as constructing the largest apartment complex in Seward County. The Rural Workforce Housing Fund will serve as a revolving loan fund, utilizing the loan payments of principal and interest to fund additional affordable housing projects. Seward County has already received 175,000 back through these payments. Seward County raised 378,000 during the second round of funding One of minute. the Rural Workforce Housing for a total investment of 1.1 million to provide more than 70 additional units. These matching funds received in Seward County came from a wide variety of sources. Some of our donors contributed to both rounds. We had families and individuals, small businesses, large businesses, and philanthropic organizations. These local donations provide a match of the grants provided by the state of Nebraska through the World Workforce Housing Program to provide a significant return on investment, not only in terms of dollars of new affordable housing, but to our workforce itself. Our communities, both rural and urban, have significant needs, and we cannot expect to fill jobs in our communities if a significant portion of our workforce is unable to find affordable housing. Thank you, colleagues. Please support. I yield my time. Senator Ibaugh, you're recognized. Mr. President, I rise to speak to the importance of workforce housing, especially as it concerns rural Nebraska. I prioritize Senator Breezy's bill for this reason. I've shared many of the models that are currently being implemented with many of you here on the floor. And um, the communities across rural Nebraska really do, do benefit. And it's really, over the past few years, I know it's been successful and it's really taking off in some of the smaller communities right now. For instance, Gothenburg and Bertrand, in Imperial and Lexington, in Grant and Seward. These are programs that are working to bring economic development and jobs and also students to our schools. I thank Senator Breezy for bringing this bill and I commend my predecessor, Senator Matt Williams, for embracing the need and for having the strategy and the foresight to put the program in place. So with that, I, I um, would just reinforce the fact that this workforce housing program is working and in small communities housing means jobs jobs mean economic success and i think that this is a valuable program i know there are other resources um, in addition to the workforce housing program that benefit our rural communities and i look forward to um, really finding more programs that work, federal programs and state programs, so that we can um, identify the uh, needs of our constituents and our rural Nebraskans to make rural workforce housing work. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Aguilar, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. President, members. I just wanna share with you one of the letters I received this morning. Dear Senator Aguilar and other state senators, I am a business owner and a property developer. My mission is to be a community developer. What does that mean? I want to bring housing to communities that will solve the housing crisis, bring jobs to the community and employers, allow individuals the opportunity to step up from their current living environment and provide the Nebraska way of life with safe, walkable communities. My company, N8 Concepts, will finish its 800th unit this year. We are working on another 120 units. We have built these units across central Nebraska in Grand Island, Norfolk, Lexington, and Kearney. All have been market rate units to date. According to the Nebraska Chamber President, Brian, President Brian Sloan, Housing is the number one issue in contributing to unfilled jobs across the state. As costs have increased, it takes twice the cash to start a project as it used to. Without additional development tools from the state, developers cannot provide the housing our state needs. Our housing crisis will continue to be a detriment to our state's economy. 
unless our state senators override the governor's veto and add additional rural workforce housing and middle income housing funds to the budget. This year, an ACONS have applied for the Nebraska Affordable Housing Trust Funds to create 200 mixed income multifamily units in Grand Island, Kearney, Columbus, Aurora, Lexington, and Central City. We need additional funds to solve the housing crisis in the state of Nebraska. We need this not only for the people of Nebraska, but also for the business owners of Nebraska, so they will have the proper housing to recruit employees to keep our state thriving and building a better future for the next generation. Colleagues, this is not the state of Nebraska building houses. It's the state of Nebraska making an investment in Nebraska's future. Another quote I'd like to share with you is from another developer in Grand Island, Raymond O'Connor. He was reading a building magazine and on the cover there was a quote from an unemployed worker. It said, why should I look for a job when there is no place to live? problem, colleagues. Therein lies the problem. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Vargas, you are recognized. Uh, I was going to respond to a couple of, of the workforce housing aspect of both of these programs.
just really simply, if you do not build it, they will not come. Or I'll say it another way, if you don't build it, they will come to Lincoln and Omaha. Why? Because we still have nursing homes. We still have high quality, state-of-the-art hospitals. We still will have housing because I think we get it right. Senator Hughes said it, gave a great summary that each community, each municipality has to come up with a housing development plan that includes revitalizing your existing housing, but also expanding and creating additional workforce and affordable housing. I just read the handout from Senator McDonald, and he, he does want to differentiate between affordable and workforce housing. He's absolutely right. There is a huge difference between affordable and workforce housing, market rate housing, and high-end housing. Most developers, I consider myself a developer, we have to look at the totality of a project. We work with the municipalities. Senator Aguilar knows very well what Grand Island has been doing. Grand Island has been very innovative and very progressive. What they're doing is they have offered tax increment financing for single family homes, which is extraordinary, which has created a lot more workforce housing with that added additional financial component that helps that developer. I do want to say that government is not building these homes. Private sector is. The private sector, our hardworking capitalists out there are delivering these homes. And they're working with all the financial funding tools that they can get their hands on. Working with the municipalities, if it's not tax increment financing, it's additional help with the infrastructure. That city, that village, that town steps up and said, yeah, we'll build that intersection, we'll build the curbs, we'll, we'll pull the, the sanitary sewer line to where you need it. This is how communities are doing it. And if, we, if they don't get the infrastructure help, they cannot build it. And it's the same with the communities out in our rural areas. What a developer is doing is called new urbanism. They're not just building a, a track of a, affordable rate housing, that can't make their numbers work. New urbanism means you build that healthy mix of affordable workforce housing and market rate housing. This is what developers are doing in Lincoln and in Grand Island and in Columbus. This is the only way you can make the numbers work. I'll just give you a quick example. In Lincoln, Nebraska, we have a large developer who is building a 150 unit apartment building. In order to get additional funding from the Nebraska affordable housing trust fund, they've committed to taking 15 of those 150 units to make them affordable. The rest, unfortunately, are all, are all market rate housing. But this is what developers are doing to make sure that there is this great new urbanism and they're actually building communities. Ray O'Connor out of Grand Island is a great example. The Mesner families, the Hoppies, they're the ones who understand how to work with each community and get their financial buy-in and get their financial support and working with all the other entities. And the other thing that these developers do, because they're smart, they develop partnerships, they de develop coalitions, they de develop collaborations with nonprofits that make this funding uh, more uh, plentiful, partnering and developing this collaborations with the nonprofits. Like NeighborWorks is a great example ha that One has minute. done that. Thank you, Mr. President. The other thing that developers are doing is in addition to this amazing mix of affordable workforce and market rate, they're also throwing in senior residential areas as a component of that, units that are specifically designed for our aging population. And if anybody looks at our demographics of our state, and they should, we are an aging population, particularly in our rural communities. Affordable workforce market rate housing is, continues to be a tremendous need. And it will be, it's an increasing need in our community. I think we all are aware 
Nebraska Chamber of Commerce, Lincoln Chamber of Commerce, Omaha Chamber of Commerce, all the Chamber of Commerce across our state agree. This is essential to the growth of our state. We need more taxpayers if we're going to try to uh, pay for the, the tax cuts to the wealthiest individuals in our state as well as Time the Senator. corporations. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. Clerk. Mr. President, some items. Explanation of vote from Senator Day. Additionally, a report from the Executive Board regarding appointments to the LR-135 Select Interim Committee, Senators Blood, Brandt, Dover, Hughes, and Mosier. Committee report from the Government, for, excuse me, from the General Affairs Committee concerning the gubernatorial appointment of Brian Botsford to the Nebraska Arts Council. Two Attorney General's opinions addressed to Senator Erdman and one to Senator Ibaugh. The Planning Committee will hold a brief executive session under the North Balcony upon recess. Planning Committee executive session under the North Balcony upon recess. And the General Affairs Committee will meet for an executive session today under the North Balcony at 115. General Affairs exec session, North Balcony 115. It's all, excuse me, Mr. President, priority motion. Senator Kalth moved recess body until 1 o'clock p.m. Senators, you've heard the motion. All those in favor say aye. All those opposed, nay. We're in recess. <laughs>